Good morning, everyone. Before we go any further in worship, as always, take a moment now, turn around, greet one another with the peace and the joy of Jesus Christ. Just a couple announcements to bring to your attention, just in case you don't know yet, uh, worship Christmas is two, three days away. Do you all know that, right? Um, family Christmas Eve worship celebration is at 5 o'clock Wednesday night, um, uh, a service that has been put together for families with children. So if you have little ones, bring them out. They'll hear the story hopefully in a relevant and meaningful way. Um, and as an adult, hopefully you'll walk away with something too. So that's at 5 o'clock. At 7 o'clock, Betsy has lined up some wonderful music, um, getting ready for the candlelight celebration, which will begin at 7.30. So that's Wednesday night. Hopefully you'll be able to fit one or both of those times into your plans. I know it's supposed to be a rainy night. It's going to be very warm here. Come on out and celebrate with us. And lastly, just a, we want to continue to bring before you, even though it's still over a month away, the Stay Treat, um, which is going to take place the very last day of January on into February 1st. There's brochures at both entrances and exits. Feel free to take one home. You can come to be part of all or just certain portions of that Stay Treat. Anything else that needs to be lifted up this morning? All right, let's uh, unite our hearts and our minds, come together, and as a church family, let us worship our God.
Let us pray. In the midst of Advent, we are reminded, contemplate the reason for our celebration and God's light. Light is everywhere in abundance now, from the Advent candles, our Christmas trees, many of our homes, the brilliant lights of our malls in downtown. The most significant light, of course, in two millennia was the star over Bethlehem, and we are especially mindful of the illumination it brought to the world. We pray that we never forget the lessons that resulted from that blessed event and that the message remains forever in our hearts. Amen. <laughs> Scripture reading this morning is Psalm 27 and can be found in page 437 of your Pew Bible. It is David's confident prayer to God to deliver him from all those who conspire to unseat him. It also addresses yet another connotation of the word light. Now hear the word of the Lord. The Lord is my light and salvation, whom shall I fear? Lord is the stronghold of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to devour my flesh, my adversaries and foes, they shall stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war rise up against me, yet I will be confident. One thing I ask of the Lord, that while I seek after, to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will set me high on a rock. Now my head is lifted up above my enemies all around me, and I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud, be gracious to me and answer me. Come, my heart says, seek his face. Your face, Lord, do I seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been of my help. Do not cast me off. Do not forsake me. O oh God of my salvation. If my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will take me up. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Do not give me up to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and they are breathing out violence. I believe that I shall see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord, be strong, and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord.
Boys and girls, why don't you come on down front at this time for the children's sermon? Are there a few of you here today? Anybody have the bag? This children's sermon bag? Hopefully you've all gotten the message. Our children's sermon bag has disappeared. Um, I don't remember who was the last family to take it home, but probably under your Christmas tree somewhere. Look for that and uh, <laughs> send it back. You guys didn't take... Do you remember who took the... The children's sermon bag the last time? It was like three weeks ago. No? Well, fortunately, I have something else to talk to you about today. I brought, um, do you guys know Miss Melinda? Where's Miss Melinda? Do you know Miss Melinda back there? Yep. She gave me something for Christmas last year. Do you know what this is? It's not just a reindeer, Jocelyn. Come on. It's Rudolph. How do you know it's Rudolph? So, Grace, tell me this. Why does Rudolph have a red nose? Do you know? Because that's how he was born. Have you ever seen Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer on TV? Yes, okay. Well, it's Christmas Eve, and what happens up in the North Pole is there's this bad storm, remember, at the very end? So why does Santa Claus go to Rudolph to lead the sleigh? Because he can't see exactly. The red nose, Rudolph's red nose, is supposed to show them where to go. See, that's the only light they have. That's the only light they have, exactly. Say that again? He, I suppose he could bring a lantern. But, but how would the reindeer hold the lantern? Where would they? Well, I think, I think, a, shiny, I think a shiny bright nose was a great solution to the problem and when I was I was in my office this morning looking at that and I realized that that's one of the reasons we call Jesus the light of the world that that like Rudolph's nose kind of lit the way and showed Santa and his sleigh where to go and in the same way Jesus as our light shows us where to go how does how does Jesus help us know where to go have you is that a hard question jocelyn he's the light of the world okay when we follow him like when we read the bible and we learn how to live our lives it kind of shows us where to go and it shows us where not to go following jesus it it kind of tells us what's the good way to live and what's the not so good way to live that's the reason We call Jesus the light of the world. And that's the reason, and you hopefully remember this from last week, that's the reason people put lights up everywhere. It's not just to make everything look pretty. It's to remind us that who is the light of the world? Jesus. Jesus. Exactly. I'm so sorry. Sorry about that. All right, let's pray. And then you guys can go to children and worship or back to your seats, okay? Shall we pray? Dear God, thank you for the lights that are all around us. We pray that over the next few days, every time we see those lights, when we plug in our Christmas trees, may all the lights remind us that you are the light of the world and that you show us how to live. In Jesus' name we pray, and everybody said, amen. Okay, thanks. You guys can go back to your seats.
please be seated. Our second passage this morning comes from the book of Revelation. Listen now for what the Spirit has to say to you. Look, I am coming soon, and my reward is with me. I will give to everyone according to what they have done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes, that they may have right to the tree of life and may go through the gates into the city. Outside are the dogs, everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright morning star. Friends, this is the word of the Lord and the poetry of the faithful. Thanks be to God. So we have three days to go. How many of you are not done with your shopping yet? Oh my goodness. That's, put your hands up again. We need to pray. That's over half of the church. We know what you'll be running around doing for the, for the next couple days. All of the candles on our Advent wreath were lit this morning by the Burns family. And our celebrations are almost here. But before we jump into the festivities, before we leave the Advent season behind, stay with me just a little longer during this important season. So often we jump right from kind of the the green part of the church year, the, the ordinary days into Christmas, and we miss Advent, or we see Advent as just nothing more than times where we shop and bake and decorate, and we forget what this season of preparation is really all about. This morning, on this last Sunday before Christmas, I want to encourage you to consider one more star sighting with me as we anticipate and kind of live in this state of waiting, of preparation. Last week, in our Old Testament reading from Numbers, we heard about a star coming from Jacob, bringing a bright future to God's people. And now, in today's reading from Revelation, we're told about another similar star. The star in this morning's passage is referred to as the bright morning star, who is actually going to make this future that was promised last week in the book of Numbers, that's going to become a reality. The bright morning star is going to make that prophecy a reality for us. And you probably don't need me to tell you that this star from Jacob, this bright morning star, is the one whose birth we're preparing to celebrate. The image of a star for Jesus is a great image. We live north of the equator, and it's the month of December. During these dark days of the winter solstice, I actually heard on the news this morning that today is the shortest day of the year. It's something like what? Seven hours of, seven, anybody know that? Where are our scientists? Seven hours and something of a few minutes of, of daylight today. As, as the shortest day of the year, when there's more darkness than at any other time, it's appropriate for us to think about Jesus as a star. Emperor Julius, back in the 4th century, did a great job of choosing, at least for those of us north of the equator, when we would celebrate the birth of the Christ. A star's present in the night sky communicates volumes. And not just about light in general, 
but in particular, light that penetrates darkness. And that's what Jesus' life was and continues to be all about. It's about light, but light coming into darkness. Light coming into what at times feels like a very dark world. I I think this year, perhaps more so than in recent years, I'm, I'm really appreciating that. These dark days in which we are living seem to be crying out for some kind of radiant beam of starlight. When black boys and men still need to be fearful of walking or driving down the wrong streets of their towns. When children are afraid to go to school because of crazy people with guns, and not just in places like Peshawar, Pakistan, but having just celebrated the anniversary of the tragedy in Newtown, Connecticut two years ago, the world just seems dark. Too dark, too often. In these days, darkness can swallow us up. We're living in a world that is wrought with fear. Fear of the unknown. Fear of technology. Fear of people who are not like us. Fear of the unfamiliar. Fear of the darkness. But the star sightings of Scripture, they're all about dispelling fear. I think that's why the words fear not appear as often as they do in the Bible. Because the darkness of the world so often grows that fear-fraught heart within all of us. In Psalm 27, that Vance just read for you this morning, it begins by asking that rhetorical question, who do I need to fear? What do we need to fear? The writer knows the answer. What is the answer? You can answer. Nothing, right? No one. There is nothing we need to fear. Because just when we think, Just when we think the darkness is going to overwhelm us, stars appear. And their glorious rays of light give us the courage we need to lift up our eyes to the hills so that we might learn again the source of our strength. In today's reading, We're challenged to look at Jesus, to think about Jesus as the bright morning star. And John uses this image in the book of Revelation because he's interested in pointing out that just like the morning star comes to chase away the darkness of night, so too does Jesus come into our lives and into our world to to chase away all the broken ways of being. The morning star The morning star explicitly heralds the end of night and the beginning of a new day. And and that's what Jesus is all about. As we grow in our walks with Jesus, we learn to celebrate every Sabbath, but particularly Christmas, we celebrate this new way of being that has come into the world. He, He is the light of that comes to all creation, challenging us to live and to serve and to care just as he did. Now this image, I think this image is only as meaningful as our understanding of light in Israel and in Rome some 2,000 years ago. You see, when we think of light today, I think most of us, we just take it for granted. But think back, transport yourself back 2,000 years. Think about how valuable, how important light was 2,000 years ago. Today, for most of us today, it's, it's no real big deal. And so when we hear about Jesus as the light of the world, I'm not sure it means all that much to us. We like the beauty 
and, and the quaintness of that image. And that's why this coming Wednesday night, people will come out of the closet to go to worship services around the world and they'll light candles and we'll sing Silent Night and we'll all feel cozy together. We love that image. But think about light 2,000 years ago. Think about light in the first century. Besides the heavens, besides the sun and the moon and the stars, perhaps a fire or a torch at some point, there was no other light. Humanity had very little, if any, control over where and when light would be present. So it was treasured. Candles. I read this week, candles were not even common until the 1800s because they were so expensive. They weren't available to average people like you and me. So light, light 2,000 years ago was never taken for granted. Further, because it was so special, the only person who was ever worthy of being compared to it, well, there was only one. The emperor. The emperor. The only person 2,000 years ago who was good enough, great enough, grand enough to be referred to as the light of the world was the emperor. Caesar Augustus was believed to have been the divine son of Apollo. The Father, the God of light. So it shouldn't surprise us that the Romans were taught and believed that their emperor, conceived by the gods, was the light of the world. If any person was being referred to in that manner, it was the emperor and only the emperor. But then, then Jesus comes along. And he lives a life unlike any other life that had ever been lived. And when people look back began and began to talk about him, they realized Caesar isn't, Caesar isn't light. Jesus, he is the light of the world, the real light. His followers were so transformed by him, by the things he taught, by the message that he preached, by the things that he did, that there was no better, no more fitting way to talk about him than as the light of the world. And so that's what they did. And when scripture was finally written, when it was all put together, Jesus, Jesus alone became the star of Jacob, the bright morning star, the light of all the world. Now, that was a slap in the face to Rome. If you stop and think about it, when Jesus started to be referred to in that way, it was a blatant slap in the face to Rome. The message of Jesus being the light of the world, that was a subversive kind of message, a subtle, maybe passive-aggressive way of attacking the governing authorities that were around them. It was filled of subtle innuendo and rebellion. Because in saying that Jesus was the light of the world, you were basically saying Caesar was not the light of the world. Is it any wonder that Rome felt threatened? If the title fit Jesus better, and that was now going to be used for him, is it any wonder Rome was on edge? Another important dimension to the light that I want to lift up this morning is basically the children's sermon. This whole idea that, that the image of light is not just one that, that brings about wholeness and goodness and brightness, but it's also the way our path is illumined. That image appears frequently in Scripture in well. Light gives us direction. So when John says in John 14 that Jesus is the light, the the way, the truth, and the life. That's, That's kind of what he's getting at. 
Jesus' way is God's way. His way, as I've already said, this way of justice and grace and peace and love, that way is the only way we can get to God. And we need to be, oh, so incredibly careful when we claim to be following God and venture outside of those godly attributes. Finally, um, one, one, one more reminder this morning that I think grows out of this image of, of Jesus as light. The light from the stars may be coming from the heavens, but where is it shining? Right here. It's shining here. And because it's shining here, the image has so much to say to us about the light that God seeks to bring to our world, to us in this place today. The whole message of Christmas is Emmanuel, God with us, right? We know that. Emmanuel means God with us. That is the message of Christmas. So this light, this way of God that brings about justice and peace and grace and love, it's not reserved for heaven. It's not reserved for some place out there in the cloud somewhere. Some place that we might go to when we die. The light that Jesus brings to our world is meant to shine here, now, today. In Jesus' day, the belief in a three-tiered universe was pretty present, right? In Jesus' day, there was this belief that God was out there. Because God was transcendent, because God was over and above us, God was believed to be somewhere up there in the clouds. We are here. Then there's this other place, kind of down there, where it's really hot, and we believe that that's where Satan supposedly is, or anything that is not of God. This three-tiered universe, it was pretty common. Today, today hopefully we've moved beyond that way of thinking about things a little bit. We're not anti-science today in this community of faith. We understand that, that that's not necessarily the best way of describing reality. God, God is not just transcendent out there. God is imminent right here. If there's a, a subtle message of incarnation of Jesus, that's it. God is here. Emmanuel is a reality. And so this kingdom that God wants to bring is not just something out there. It too is something right here. And even though Jesus dies, the Spirit of Christ lives on. And so when the writers of the New Testament talk about walking in the light as He as is in the light, that's what it's getting at. It's that this, this presence of God, it doesn't end when Jesus dies. It continues on in each one of us. And that's why when you read the New Testament, this idea of light, it kind of shifts. There are passages in, in the New Testament where it talks about Jesus as the light, and then there are other passages where who is talked about as being the light? Us. We are the, the light in the world. When Jesus, when the, when the gospel writers talk about you do not put a light under a bushel basket, but you set it up on a lampstand for all to see, he's not talking just about Jesus. He's talking about our lives. We now bear that divine spark, that holy light that was so eminent in the life of Jesus, and we now bear that to the world around us. In this passage from Revelation. John is reminding all of us that somehow, some way, transformation is going to come. The book of Revelation is about transformation of the world. And it's going to come about because of light. The light of Jesus 
and the light of Jesus that still burns in each one of us. The New Jerusalem that is such a prominent theme in the book of Revelation is not about somewhere else. It's about life here on earth. This is where we can find the courage and the strength to dispel the darkness that just seems to be everywhere. Scholars, um, let me give you some theology here this morning. Scholars talk about this. Do you know what eschatology is? What is eschatology? The end time. Thank you, Dominic. Study of the end times. So often, we tend to think that the end is going to come about when God does something. We talked about this, or at least I talked about it in Sunday school this morning. We think that God is going to do something at the end and just make everything as it's supposed to be. The books that we have been studying in some of our small groups and on Sunday morning talk about a different way of thinking about eschatology. An eschatology that is participatory. Participatory eschatology. That's such an important dimension to Christmas because this light that God gave to Jesus that continues to burn in us It's to transform the world. We participate in the end. We are bringing about God's kingdom. You and I, each and every time, we fan that little spark, that little flame that burns within us. We may not be able to completely eliminate darkness from the world. We maybe can't do away with everything that is not of God. We can't stop people with guns from doing crazy things. We cannot end wars in far off places. We cannot always feed the starving child that is 2,000 miles away from us, halfway around the world, but we can make a difference here. The darkness that exists all around us today, it can be changed by the light that burns in you and in me. And if Christmas is about anything, if Advent has any meaning to our lives, it's about the realization that the light of the world is here and it's burning within us. The message on this fourth Sunday in Advent is all about light. This week's star sightings, if you're following along in your Advent devotional, they remind us that in Jesus, we have a light that defeats darkness, a light that can dispel any fear, a light that is not defined by Caesar or any other national leader. It's a light that directs our lives in every day, moves us closer to the things of God. It's a glorious light. And the stars, the stars are meant to remind us of that. So over the next couple of days, before you leave Advent and jump into Christmas, take a moment to look up and to be reminded. Holy God, some of these folks have a lot of shopping left to do. (laughs) These next few days will be a little busy for them. But for all of us, we pray for those quiet moments to look up that we might be reminded. In Jesus' name we pray. Would our ushers please come forward at this time to receive the offering.
Let's spend these last few moments we have together in, in a time of prayer. We certainly want to remember all of those who are traveling and who are not here today, going to be with family. We want to celebrate those who are home. I know a lot of families have uh, visitors. We're glad you're all here. What else can we, can we remember this morning in prayer? Yes, Anita? So we will pray for your family grieving the loss of your sister and we will give thanks that you and your grandkids are safe. What else? Anything more we want to list up today? Continue to lift up. Carla and everyone on the road are in the air. planning to go shopping right after worship. That's why you want me to end it and just get on with things, right? <laughs> Anything else this morning? Let's, uh, let's, we're so prone to just kind of think of ourselves, but um, there is a lot of darkness. We certainly want to remember all of the families who, who lost children over in Pakistan. We want to remember, um, and I should have done this last week, but we want to continue to remember families up in Newtown, Connecticut that continue to grieve during this um, time of year that's supposed to be full of joy and happiness. Um, just the world. We want to remember the world, the darkness of our world today. Debbie? Yes, thank you. The two officers, uh, we want to remember their families up in New York City that were killed. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Gracious God. In a world that is full of darkness, we give you thanks for light. And tomorrow, when the daylight we know and experience increases by just two or three seconds, we pray that that might be symbolic of a light that will continue to grow in our lives, in the life of this church family in the life of our community, our nation, our world. God, we pray for the courage to be bearers of that light. The light that we know because of Jesus. May our celebrations in a couple days be joyful. May we appreciate times with family and friends. But God, may it not diminish on December 26th. May it continue to grow, transforming us and our world. We do thank you for the bright morning star, Jesus. Hear us now as we pray the prayer he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please stand now for our closing carol.
Now, friends, as you go forth from this place, know that the light goes with you, behind you to encourage you, beside you to befriend you, above you to watch over you, within you to strengthen you, and always before you to show you its way. And all God's people agreed and said, Amen.